Thank you very much for this opportunity and welcome to the Chronicle. Thank you very much for your interest and you are certainly welcome to the EU delegation. EU was always, has always been one of the biggest partners the Gambia ever had, especially at the, those crucial moments before the election, during the election process and during the political impasse. To start with, um, as a union, as an organization, what were your hopes, your aspirations, your dreams, but also your goals for the Gambia after the change of government? Well, thank you very much for the question. Indeed, the European Union has been a staunch supporter for this transition now and for the change. The hope we had was the same hope like the Gambian people had. Freedom, prosperity, development. I think it's equally important for us because we also look at it from a regional uh, perspective. I think uh, the more secure the Gambia is, the more prosperous, the more free, the more democratic, uh, the more it will have a positive impact on the region as a whole. And indeed, for the European Union to have countries as their partners who are embarking on a, on a democratic transition is really a good cause to support. Matching those um, aspirations and goals for the Gambia against the reality on the ground today, under this new government, where are we? It's two and a half years. Uh, and we also know, uh, as like as I believe, all the Gambians deep in their heart, that the challenges ahead of this uh, first coalition government in the country were tremendous. Uh, back in 2017, the country was on a cliff, a step ahead from collapsing, financially speaking. The transition when it comes to the society is also huge. Uh, to change the mindset of the people, uh, to, of course, uh, do a kind of deal uh, among the progressive parties in the country, so focuses on the future and development. Yet, at the same time, you also have to close the past. And all these changes, uh, reconciliation uh, for the people to, uh, to agree with and to be happy about, I mean, these are tremendous challenges. Now, um, I do believe in that sense, there are achievements which the Gambia can be very proud of. Uh, if I might just name, for example, the transitional justice as a whole, including the truth and reconciliation process going on, which is, uh, I believe, not only a success story in the country, but I think this process is, is of quality work. Uh, tremendous efforts, of course, which eventually be taught in schools in the future. If you look at the constitutional review process, which is hell of a job to do, and yet very, very ambitious goals and, and very impressive progress already made. We are expecting the new draft to come out sometime in the coming month. Uh, so if I look at these aspects, I believe the Gambia is making progress. If I look at civil society as a whole, mm. I mean, no one can, even a blind can see that there is a very vivid civic life in the country, very vivid democratic life in the country. People are expressing their views. Um, on, on like, very much unlike the, during the former Oh, regime. yes, absolutely different. I mean, the country is colorful. There is a vibrant civil society, which I think is important for the, for the development of the country. And it's important for the, for the development and maturing of the Gambian democracy as a whole. Uh, if I look at newly established institutions like the National Human Rights Commission, which de facto started operating early this year, However, I think by now they became a really respected institution in terms of uh, protecting uh, human rights in the country. Uh, so these are, I believe, very significant progresses. I also believe there are good promising improvements in terms of other aspects of governance. I remember that there was no handover whatsoever between the old regime and the new government. Mm. Therefore, for all the new ministers, line ministers, it was like a, like a territory to be, to, be, to be learned and to be explored as to what is the real situation. Mm. Uh, remember the other commission, the Johnny Commission, when, when investigating different dealings of the previous um, dictator and, 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 and his uh, close allies. 
I mean, we came to know about different debts and different contracts and, and many different issues along the way of these investigations. Mm -hmm. So I think for any government in a position like that, it was not an easy handover. Mm -hmm. And it was not uh, a, a, a situation whereby they could really see from where they depart. Mm -hmm. Now, L let's look at among please. the key issues that um, Gambians have been yearning for and EU have been calling for and have been stressing on is the issue of security reform. Absolutely. Where are we as far as the EU is concerned? Well, we, we made it very clear to the government that we are interested in providing assistance for a peaceful and, 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 and safe transition. And indeed, we kept our pledges. We, we sponsored a lot of uh, instruments or interventions to, to secure peace in the country. So we invested a lot in that regard. Including on ECOMIG? Including on ECOMIG. Um, we have a few projects uh, regarding the sector, sector reform uh, management as such, but we also specifically uh, funded the uh, stationing of the ECOWAS troops in the country based on ECOWAS request. Uh, as we speak now, the second mandate is also the current mandate which comes to an end in September, is also being uh, sponsored and funded by the European Union taxpayers' money. Um, beside that, we also made it very clear to government that they will have to use this period of time when there are the forces in the country for really making visible uh, reform process mm. in the security sector because of the simple fact that we all know that the current dispositive is not really sustainable, neither necessarily professional. And Gambia deserves and needs a professional security force. Mm. Including what is not sustainable? You mean the 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 everybody ECOMIG as well being here? Everybody and the EU paying indeed. for it? Yeah. I mean ECOMIG is not an EU decision. ECOMIG forces stationed in the country is an ECOWAS decision. Let me just uh, recall the fact that in the last ECOWAS summit a couple of weeks ago. Uh, ECOWAS authority decided to postpone the, I mean, to prolong the mandate of the of the ECOMIC forces. So there is an additional six month period during which time ECOMIC forces will uh, for sure stay in the country, which practically means from uh, end of September this year till end of uh, March next year. This is an ECOWAS decision. The funding is another issue. So far, ECOWAS Authority approached the European Union and asked for funding assistance, which so far we did. Regarding the six-month extension, there is no such request yet arrived at the EU level, so I cannot speculate on, on, on that regard. But when it comes to sustainability, indeed, it means that the Gambia should have a security dispositive which is for the purpose and which is affordable and sustainable for the Gambia to sponsor it on long term. In other words, the Gambia, for example, needs professional police uh, for the obvious uh, mandate. And this is what the people demand. Uh, whereas right now we know that in some aspect the police is not structured, neither equipped the right way mm. for, for it to be able to tackle all the challenges uh, and execute their mandate. Many are saying in the country, and there is a sort of uh, consensus in that regard, that uh, during the Jamais time, the armed forces have been ballooned up in terms of numbers, not necessarily well equipped either. So the challenge for the government is also to make a rationalization of what is available. Perhaps some, uh, some personnel should be or could be transferred, retrained and transferred from one uh, security service to another one. In, in other words, cutting down the army? Well, I don't want to simplify it like cutting down the army because the armed forces are more than just the army. On the other hand, the emphasis is not on cutting but rationalizing to make sure that whatever is the threat, the Gambia has got the security dispositive uh, available to uh, eff effectively respond to that threat. And I think this is a very difficult process. Mm -hmm. Now, let me be very factual. Indeed, a great achievement is the fact that, first time ever, the country now adopted a national security policy. I think it's a basic uh, fundamental document, if you wish. Uh, we know that there are 
drafting exercise is going on regarding the strategy mm. to implement this policy, regarding also a strategy for the security sector reform. These are important papers and important policy documents or strategy documents, but equally important for the population, for the average Gambian, mm. to see that the security forces are being reformed. Now, I was just on a country trip past weekend, and I can tell you if you drive from here in Fajara all the way to Soma mm. or not to mention Basse, you will probably go across much more number of uh, police and military checkpoints mm. than if you were driving from here to Dakar, which for the average Gambian shows that the modus operandi remained the same, which may not be necessary. I mean, remember, there is a, a protocol in the ECOWAS region about the free movement. movement. I do believe it got to be questioned whether or not a military checkpoint is necessary, not to say justified. These are complaints I receive from many communities, many uh, average Gambian, if you wish. And I think these are also part and parcel of the SSR, the reform as a whole of mm. the security sector. Um, at the end of the day, this is not only about the checkpoint itself. At the end of the day, it is about costs. Taxpayers are paying contributions to the national budget from which these forces are sponsored. Mm. If they are sponsored for maintaining a checkpoint which doesn't really bring added value, I think they rightly have the question why those checkpoints are there. Mm. Um, as I said over the weekend, I, 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 I had a a private uh, driving around the country and I could see some of these checkpoints are just there for for no special purposes. Mm. Um, I also believe that when it comes to a transition like in the Gambia now it's keenly important to make sure that the population associates these many changes with some sort of positive feeling. If, if, if they don't have a positive feeling the changes may not be uh, sustainable. Mm. If the average farmer up country doesn't associate something positive with democracy growing in the country now, then that democracy may not be well embedded in the society. I'm not saying that people are not happy for democracy. Mm. What I'm saying they should also feel it in their daily life. Uh, feel it because they have easier job opportunities, feeling it because they have a, a better standard of living or they have better services provided by the government, by the state, something which is a positive feeling. In that regard, I believe there is also um, a, a, way, a long way to go. Mm. But on the other hand, it is equally important that people are well informed of what these changes are, mm. what these changes entail, so to avoid uh, unrealistic expectations. Mm. We know for a fact that right after the changes, as you mentioned, euphoria was in the country and indeed everybody, everybody believed that instantly there will be a much better way of life. It doesn't come that fast, mm. not least because the country's fiscal situation is not really uh, sorted out yet. The, the indebtedness of the country, the debt services, the country has to pay is extremely challenging. Even if it is in the range of 88% of the GDP with the new calculation, it is very high and it is not sustainable. Therefore, the government is doing uh, a lot of efforts in terms of uh, restructuring the debts. If you but just... aren't you worried because, uh, I mean, when, for example, we've seen that the Indian president yes. was here, figures were quoted millions of dollars you know for this for that what has not been made clear is whether there are loans or grants or anything like that and then mm. some experts are concerned that the Gambia is of course we are hugely indebted but we keep on taking you know more loans and we did indebtedness keep growing I certainly agree with you uh, as far as I could read in the papers and different different reporting it was unclear to me as well uh, what is the percentage of grant and loan and, and, and how is this, um, this uh, debt service uh, kind of um, uh, reconsidered vis -a -vis regarding the, the, the debt uh, and the loans from India. But this is a question you, you, you have to ask the government because I'm not uh, privy to such information. On the other hand, it's indeed a concern. Uh, what I am happy to, uh, to, to state is that the, as far as EU 
uh, development assistance is concerned, we are talking about grants. So when it comes to the uh, EU package, we promised the new government back in 2017, the total of 365 million. The International Conference for the Gambia held in Brussels last year was actually a top up to what we already promised the government before. Mm -hmm. So out of this 365 million euro development assistance as a whole from the European Union, we can also proudly say that we have roughly one third of it coming in the form of budgetary support, which mm -hmm. means cash transfer from EU Treasury to the Gambian Treasury. This is the only cash component of the of the overall support, the rest is uh, in project yeah. intervention. Yeah. And, uh, so, sorry to interrupt you there, just Please. to pick up on that. Um, there is a lot of concern and anxiety um, in the country as to the government's transparency or lack of transparency when it comes to especially money, monies that come in and where they go. I mean, EU, you've given money to the Gambia, you've always been. I mean, like you said, one third of what you played um, is already forthcoming. Um, how do you check to make sure that these monies go where they are supposed to go? First of all, let me, let me uh, clarify something which I, I believe helps understanding how this budgetary support mechanism works. Every intervention by the EU is based on legal grounds. So in, 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 in practical terms, this budgetary support means that there is a so-called uh, state and resilience building contract concluded between the Gambian authorities and the European Union. This contract has got benchmarks, which practically means if the government achieves certain benchmarks, a certain component of the budgetary support can be dispersed. So in simple words, the EU is not giving budgetary support to, to the Gambian government to do something. The EU sets benchmarks, and once the Gambian government achieves those benchmarks, then the disbursement is done. In other words, we are actually rewarding mm. progress made by the government. I'll tell you one example. Back in 2017, when the first 30 million, 25 million disbursement came, the benchmarks were benchmarks jointly established with the government, mm -hmm. for example, releasing all political prisoners, making freedom of speech the name of the day uh, in the country, respect for rule of law. And these were benchmarks achieved by the government after which the disbursement was made. What was that money used for? Basically for two things, debt management as well as paying salaries of public servants, uh, teachers, doctors, etc., etc in the whole system, because the, the, the country at that time, in 2017, was really at the edge of, of bankruptcy. Mm. So we do have built-in mechanisms to check on what the money is spent on, but in terms of the budgetary support, this is disbursed only after the government met those benchmarks. Those benchmarks are always worked out in collaboration with the government, so they are achievable. They are not something we set ourselves and impose upon the government. But this is not something we give in advance. Mm. Therefore, the use of it afterwards is not really uh, up to us to detect in the sense, or monitor, in the sense that as long as it is used within the government national budget, that's fine. Because remember, the time we disperse the money, by that time the government already fulfilled the preconditions for that given disbursement. Mm -hmm. And then that was my, my concern, not um, the conditions for which or on which the monies are, the, are disbursed, but then how the monies are used after fulfilling. Oh, don't those get conditions. me wrong. Don't get yeah. me wrong. In these interventions, we also provide assistance for the government to improve its public management mm. uh, capacities, because we do believe uh, when it is managing budget, which is basically taxpayers' money or donors' uh, money, if you wish. It is extremely important that there is transparency and accountability. We are supporting the government for that and we are also demanding a lot from the government in terms of uh, public finance management, but also including in terms of fight against corruption. Mm. Let me be very clear, there is no country in the world, not even in the European Union, which is free from corruption. Corruption is there. This is unfortunately the characteristic of any human-made system. The question is not that. The question is, 
if there is corruption, if there is sign of corruption, how are the authorities responding to that? And that's where we also encourage the government to do much more and to really launch a fight against corruption on whatever level. But is there any visible sign of it, corruption in the Gambia under this administration? Well, I, uh, I am not sure if it is under this administration, but I can tell you just over the weekend, when you pass a checkpoint, I was asked for my voluntary contribution to the welfare of the troops. A, a cup of tea or a tapalapa. I mean, is it not corruption? I believe it's a widespread corruption. By it, the police at checkpoints? By the military or the police at the checkpoint. Uh, if you go to the ferry did station... They, did, they, did they know who you were? Well, they must have known who I am because they saw the number plate. And I have a diplomatic number plate. Whether they know me in person or not, it doesn't make a difference. Because regardless, it's a diplomatic number plate or a, an average number plate, Gambian number plate. Mm. They should not ask that. What's your if you go to the ferry station, mm -hmm. you see the long queue of those trucks and cars waiting for days and days to cross the river. I witnessed, when I was standing there, one occasion I had to wait six hours at the, body, at the ferry station to get on board of a ferry. I could monitor what's, what was going on. These are visible signs. We have many complaints from business, investors, business personnel, business people about corruption they have to, they are confronted with when it comes to asking for certain permits certain licenses certain procedures now i do believe this is again there is no country in the world that there is no corruption mm -hmm. the question is what the authorities are doing about it and i do believe as gambia badly needs investors coming to this country investing foreign capitals creating jobs making a boom in the economy i do believe it makes it makes it extremely important that there is such a strong and firm resistance and fight against corruption, mm. not least by also establishing the National uh, Anti-Corruption uh, Commission, for the government to help and create a more conducive business environment where foreign investors feel free and safe uh, to come and help the development of the country. One of the key issues of debate, discussion in this country at the moment is the issue of whether or not the President Barrow should um, stick to the quote-unquote agreement that he had with his coalition partners to go for three years and then step down or go for a full five-year term as mandated by the Constitution. And as a result, there's a um, lot of discussions Mm. going on, concerns, fears, that um, come December, people will take to the streets um, under the banner of Three Years Jotna Movement. And um, we've seen in Brikama a couple of months ago, the president held rallies, one speaker after the other, including the interior minister, warning protesters against the December plan, the quote-unquote plan mm -hmm. protests, and even threatening to use water cannons and then things like that. What is the position of the EU when it comes to this issue, the issue of people taken to the streets likely to protest and the possibility of the authorities using heavy-handedness to stop the protest? The question you are asking is very complex because here we see cornerstones of any democracy involved or affected cornerstones like basic values, like uh, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, whereas respect for rule of law is equally important. I'm starting from these core values because this is what is enshrined in democratic countries' constitution. The European Union stands for these uh, core values. And let, let's make it very kind of clear from a European Union perspective, rule of law and democracy in the country are key importance during this transition. If you look at rule of law, the law of the land, the constitution, which, has, which is in force now and which has never been suspended in the past three years, the rule of law says 
an elected president stays, may stay in office for five years. So from a legal perspective, from a legal point of view, there is nothing wrong with the winner of the 2016 presidential election to stay in power for five years. Legally speaking, there is no requirement in any other way. It is also true, many are claiming that there were promises made. When you refer to this uh, agreement, so-called agreement among the coalition parties, um, we all know that this agreement is not really an agreement. This was a draft memorandum of understanding which effectively wasn't really signed by the participants. Nevertheless, even if it had been signed, that's not a legal instrument which would repeal the constitutional provision. So what we are, uh, from my uh, perspective, what we are talking about here is a moral question. Any politician who makes promises are to be held accountable for whatever promises he, may, he or she made. Uh, so this issue of whether it is right or not by President Barrow to stay in office for five years is not really a legal issue. I'm not judging whether the president is right or not. I'm not judging whether uh, three years Jotna is right or wrong. What I am saying is they are expressing their views and they shall be allowed to express their views because freedom of expression is a cornerstone of any democracy in anywhere in the world. Uh, as like as any other civil society initiatives are free to protest as we speak now and, and, and you can see in the country protests and demonstrations here and there all the time. Uh, so there is a healthy environment, as long as they follow the rules for, for permits, etc., they are allowed to do protestation. Um, so I'm not judging on these issues. What I am saying is that these are moral questions, political questions, which this country, including the civil society and the many different political parties, will have to address. Uh, but once again, uh, from an EU perspective, we cannot say that there is a legal requirement for, for the incumbent president to step down after three years. He may do so if right. he so wishes. But would you but have trust problem, trusting when the president say, I will step down after three years, and then before that he made a U-turn and said, no, I'm well, not. Frankly speaking, uh, it's for us, European Union perspective again, it is not about trust. This trust is between those elected and those who voted for him. And they will have to make and draw a conclusion. So for, for us, it's, it's not really uh, an issue. In terms of trust, there exists between the European Union and the Gambia, uh, in terms of the political and, and development partnership. Uh, but that is not related to facts, whether he made uh, promises here and there during the, during the campaign period. Um, but again, we have to come back to the, to the bottom line question. Even when those promises were made, even when the Memorandum of Understanding was drafted, it was quite clear that those lines were not in harmony with the constitution of the country. Will you be disappointed if people in like numbers take to the streets in December to push for the president to step down? Well, if the demonstration is authorized because they follow the, the rules and they got the permit for demonstration, they go for the demonstration. It's not really up to me whether I like it or not. Uh, for me, what is important that the rule of law is the name of the game in the country, that freedom of expression is indeed ensured, even under difficult circumstances. And I think it's important to also highlight that although there were very tragic outcome of, of many of these demonstrations in the past two and a half years. Yet, this new government, this new Gambia, did allow its citizens, its voters, to express their views free, uh, freely and, and, and whenever they, they wish to do so. Um, again, here we have to see clearly that the constitution has been in place 
and no laws in the country has really been formally suspended. Mm. So it is important that this transition takes place within this legal framework. And eventually, many of the laws will be repealed and replaced by new ones in the coming period. Let's look briefly at the issue of um, electoral reforms, or the need for electoral reform. In terms of reforms, at the moment, electoral reforms, as far as the EU is concerned, where should the Gambia move from and to? Thank you for the question. The elector electoral reform process is also, I believe, a great achievement in this country. I, let, me, let me certainly take this opportunity to express my, 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 my most sincere gratitude to the Independent Electoral Commission, the chairman and its staff, as well as to the Minister of Justice. Because in this particular regard, I also believe that in spite of the short period of time, there is great progress made. But we believe that at this stage of democracy in the country, there is room for improving political financing, party financing, campaign financing, because we do believe that voters, they need to know who is behind these financing issues. Yeah. In other words, who is paying for the campaign, how a political party is uh, maintaining its, its, uh, its existence, yeah. how it generates income and support, because I believe this is also as a kind of part of the checks and balances in any democracy in the world. Mm. Uh, we made the recommendations, so it's really now the ball is, uh, is rolling on the, on the Gambian side of the court. We will see what the, what the final electoral law will be. Mm. Masadou Lyos, thank you very much. You are certainly welcome.